Gem Saga. Sargon, would it harm you if I... You may use your tricorder, Mr. Spock. Your readings will show energy, but no substance. Sealed in this receptacle is the essence of my mind. Pure energy. Matter without form. Impossible. But you once had a body of some type. A body much as yours, my children. Although our minds were infinitely greater. That's twice you've referred to us as my children. Because it is possible you are our descendants, Captain Kirk. 6,000 centuries ago, our vessels were colonizing this galaxy, just as your own starships have now begun to explore that vastness. As you now leave your own seed on distant planets, so we left our seed behind us. Perhaps your own legends of an Adam and an Eve were two of our travels. What kind of man does it take to build an empire? And not just any empire, but the very first in the history of man, when only kingdoms and cities had come before. We have only scattered fragments to consult, but these pieces of the puzzle tell us something nonetheless about how the Mesopotamians would answer that question. Their answer comes in the form of two stories that take us all the way back to the third millennium BC. Sumer, the mother of civilization, had raised to adolescence a brilliant but unruly brood of cities, kings, and dynasties mired in fratricidal rivalry. And now the birth throes of empire gripped this land, staining its sons and daughters drop by drop with blood. Soon, they would be awash in it. Though the deluge was let loose not by a Sumerian, but instead by an orphaned outsider from the north. His name? was Sargon of Akkad, and he would be the blood-soaked prophet of empire. In the birth legend of Sargon of Akkad, a Neo-Assyrian text, we are told that as a mere infant, he was sent down the Euphrates in a basket of rushes sealed with bitumen, an origin story not unlike that of Moses. And we are also told that Sargon's mother bore him in secret, and that she was a figure of importance, a high priestess devoted to the cult of the goddess Ishtar. So this may have been for his own protection. Still, the identity of Sargon's father was unknown to him, so we can only speculate as to why Sargon needed to be spirited away. Perhaps his father was a king, making Sargon a threat to the legitimate line of succession. Or perhaps he was nothing more than a common rogue who seduced or forced himself on Sargon's mother, making him a child of regret. Regardless, the infant survived this baptismal ordeal, carried by a strong current to a man named Aki, a simple drawer of water who would raise Sargon as his own. After that, we are told that Sargon's childhood was laborious. He worked as an orchard keeper, and for all intents and purposes, it seemed that his lot in life would be a simple one. But Ishtar, goddess of love, fertility, and war, had other plans for him. This goddess, the same one Sargon's mother served as a temple priestess, was the Mesopotamian Aphrodite, with a more warlike bent. She was known to seduce mortals and raise them up to divine heights, even if only for a single night. Gilgamesh famously spurned her, knowing all about the perils that often befell one of her hapless lovers. In return for this slight, she killed his closest friend. Unlike Gilgamesh, Sargon seems to have embraced this divine affiliation, and as we shall see, it would serve him exceedingly well. With Ishtar's blessing, Sargon was lifted beyond his humble station as an orchard keeper, and he soon found himself in the court of King ur zababa of Kish, occupying the position of cupbearer. With such proximity to the king, Sargon held an important but dangerous position. According to the Sumerian poem Sargon and ur zababa the second of our two stories, Sargon was loyal and honest in his conduct toward his master, even as the gods conspired to revoke ur -Zababa's divine right of kingship. We do not know why the gods turned against ur -Zababa, but their fickleness was a well-established theme by this point, especially when it came to granting kingship. To begin to understand them, one must accept that the Mesopotamian gods were in and of the land itself. 
they behave no differently from the freak storms that ravaged those plains, heralded but briefly by ominous clouds that streaked across the sky, only to disappear just as swiftly when Enlil lost interest in sending down lightning bolts and thunderclaps. And it would be none other than Enlil who decided to revoke Urzababa's kingship. For Ishtar's part, she was only too happy to continue playing her role as Sargon's watchful guardian, helping him overcome the intrigues of Urzababa's court. It would not be long after Sargon's appointment that Master and Cupbearer alike became afflicted with terrible nightmares. One of these even resulted in Urzababa passing urine, blood, and pus in the middle of the night, with the poem comparing him to a fish floundering in brackish water. That same night, Sargon's slumber would also be disrupted by a dream in which Urzababa was drowned in a river of blood sent by Ishtar. Groaning and gnashing his teeth, Sargon's distress was so great that he was soon awoken by an attendant and summoned to the alerted king's presence. He was then questioned as to the contents of his dream, and much to the credit of the young Sargon, he answered with unvarnished honesty. This was not the most prudent course of action, but then again, those favored by the gods play by different rules. Your majesty, said Sargon to Urzababa, in my dream there was an extraordinary young woman, high as the sky, wide as the world, standing strong as a fortress wall. To me it seemed as if she drowned me in a great flood, a river of blood. Frightened by this ill omen which he rightly took to portend his doom, Urzababa dismissed Sargon. Left to his own devices, it became clear to him Sargon had to die. And so Urzababa began to scheme and plot. Why Urzababa decided against simply executing this foreign upstart remains a mystery. It may have been that Sargon was popular not just with the gods, but also with the people of Kish, making the act of killing him a political liability. Whatever the case, Urzababa's hasty scheme involved tasking Sargon, who regularly ran errands for him, to deliver to his chief smith a bronze hand mirror. The unsuspecting Sargon was then to be thrown into the smith's forge, located in the Isikil, the fated house. When the appointed time came, Sargon, none the wiser, took the mirror and proceeded to the Isikil, where Ishtar herself was said to have awaited him. She barred the entrance on the grounds that Sargon, being polluted with blood, was forbidden from entering a site considered holy. Urzababa Smith had no recourse but to meet Sargon at the gate of the fated house instead where he collected the mirror and returned to the forge, leaving Sargon unharmed. Then, some time passed, the calm before the storm, until Sargon, still none the wiser, returned to Urzababa's palace. The king became even more frightened, and he was now assured of the cosmic reweighing of the scales that was taking place. And so he concocted an even more harebrained scheme. He dispatched Sargon on another errand, this time to meet with the famed Lugal Zagezi, the king of Uma who had conquered much of Sumer and ruled from the ancient city of Uruk. Sargon was to bring to Lugal's Gezi a written message that requested Sargon be killed. A similar story is told in the Iliad of Bellerophon, the son of Poseidon who slew the mythical Chimera. He too was dispatched with a written message that was meant to spell his doom, except in his case it was bound in a sealed envelope. But as the Sumerian poem makes only too clear, this is before the advent of papyrus scrolls, so any such message with which Sargon would be entrusted would have been written on a clay tablet, its contents laid bare to the literate, which Sargon almost certainly was. Barring some secret cuneiform code that the two kings shared, this makes for a disappointing plot hole in an otherwise entertaining story, muddling its climax. When Sargon reached Uruk, we are left to assume that he either already knew of the plot by reading the clay tablet, or he found out from Lugal Zagezi thereafter. Either way, following this revelation, Sargon got to work, making allies with Lugal Zagezi even as he supposedly seduced his wife according to one bit of juicy Mesopotamian gossip. He then marched on Kish alongside him. Not long after that, we find Sargon seated on the thrones of Kish and Akkad alike having made one king soil himself and cuckolding another. Not bad for a gardener. As you may have surmised already, it could very well be that both of these stories are pure fiction. But then again, let us consider that parts of the saga may be true. Sargon of Akkad may have been a self-made man, a palace gardener brought high 
and caught in the intrigues of a court and city threatened by the ascendant Lugal Zagazi. This would explain any record of why Urzababa was so on edge. Perhaps the real Sargon was a more astute political operator, sensing which way the wind was blowing and turning on Urzababa without any outright provocation. Perhaps he had already ascended from cupbearer to ruler of Akkad, and thereby meant to secure his city's independence from Kish. Either of these explanations seems more palpable when we consider that a state of conflict may have existed between Urzababa and Lugal Zagazi, making it unlikely that the former was in a position to make any requests of the latter. But we simply cannot know for certain. Now, as we pass from myth to history, let us take a break from the sequence of events that make up the life of Sargon and discuss what we know of his city, Akkad, as well as the surrounding region, the people, and the language that they spoke. Much like Sargon, little is known for certain about the origins of Akkad and its people. The city was either founded by Sargon or brought to prominence by him, a prominence that outlasted his lifetime, with the city still being referred to in the days of the Achaemenid Empire. Sadly, the exact location of the city of Akkad has been lost to the sands of time, or more precisely, the sands of modern-day Iraq. We suspect that it is located somewhere within a 20-mile radius of Baghdad, and it could be that it is buried underneath the city itself. We do not know where the people of Akkad came from, or how long they inhabited the northern border of Sumer. They seem to have been outsiders, a rough and hardy nomadic bunch who favored herding over farming. Their winters and summers were harsh, even if the location they occupied was remarkably well situated, with the fertile Sumerian plains to the south, the mineral-rich highlands of present-day Iran to the east, and the pastoral lands of the middle and upper Euphrates to the north. The center of gravity in the region seems to have been Kish, which faced only token resistance from the cities of Mari and Akshak. Therefore, it is little wonder that Kish would play such a prominent role in the rise of Sargon. On the topic of language, Sargon and his people spoke not Sumerian, but Akkadian, a language of Semitic origins. Semitic is no doubt a term you've heard before, but perhaps not in this context. It is a term that was coined in the late 18th century to describe a group of related languages like Akkadian, Aramaic, Arabic, and others. Because Semitic was a regionally concentrated language prior to the rise of the Islamic Caliphates, it has also come to describe a people with a distinct set of cultural traditions, namely the Hebrew and Arabic peoples. Today, Arabic is the most widely spoken Semitic language, with Hebrew and Amharic and Ethiopian language also being classified in this way. Ancient Sumerian, on the other hand, is not a Semitic language. It is what's called a language isolate, meaning a language with no known descendants. After the rise of the Sargonic Empire, Sumerian would become a sort of lingua sacra used in ceremonial contexts until its death, while Akkadian would be like English today, the lingua franca of the Mesopotamian world, used for political purposes, literary works, and by traders who had no other way to communicate with each other. It is because of the Akkadians' enduring success in empire building that the language is called what it is in the first place and it would develop into the language spoken by the later Babylonians and Assyrians with different dialects. However, the Akkadians never developed writing, so for this purpose they adopted Sumerian cuneiform, which was progressively adapted over time. Under Sargon's successors, new cuneiform characters would be introduced, and the Akkadian cuneiform that appeared in administrative documents would assume a large, elegant, widely spaced rectilinear shape that distinguished it from earlier Sumerian cuneiform. But in the early stages of this linguistic transition, cuneiform writing was simply meant to be read in Sumerian and then translated verbally to Akkadian, suggesting the prevalence of a bilingual tradition with Sargon himself probably being fluent in both Sumerian and Akkadian. Let us now return to where we left off in the life of Sargon. The rest of the story is better grounded in history, but it proceeds at a dizzying pace nonetheless, for not long after he assumed control of Kish and Akkad, Sargon turned on his former ally, Lugal Zagazi. At this point, Lugal Zagazi controlled Uruk, the once proud city of Gilgamesh, his native city of Uma, as well as Ur, Nippur, Eridu, Zabala, Lagash, and Larsa. Going up against him was equivalent to taking on all of Sumer. And yet somehow, Sargon emerged victorious. In defeating Lugal Zagazi and all of his allies, 
Sargon would capture as many as 50 governors and just as many cities. These battles would be the first of 34 campaigns that Sargon supposedly took part in during his 56-year reign, an extraordinary military record, even if our grasp on all the details is tenuous at best. Indeed, we know frustratingly little about the means with which Sargon triumphed over his foes, both on a strategic and tactical level. We know that he was able to feed an army of 5,400 men, but we have limited insight into what sort of odds he faced. And furthermore, there is no battle of Guagamela or siege of Elysia that we can point to as evidence of his military genius. But the results of a great captain speak for themselves, and it is the results, bloody and destructive as they are, that surviving Akkadian art and literature almost lovingly dwell on. Take, for instance, the inscription on a clay tablet found in Nippur, celebrating the exact moment Sargon triumphed over Lugal Zagazi. Quote, Sargon, king of Akkad, overseer of Ishtar, king of Kish, anointed of Anu, king of the land, governor of Enlil, he defeated the city of Uruk and tore down its walls. In the battle of Uruk he won, took Lugal Zagazi, king of Uruk, in the course of the battle, and led him in a collar to the gate of Enlil. End quote. In addition to that, we have a stele depicting Sargon smiting Lugal Zagazi on the head with a mace, an act of violence which in those days explicitly symbolized conquest. With Lugal Zagazi safely out of the picture and the city of Uma destroyed, Sargon consolidated his control of Sumer before setting his sights on more distant lands. Though the line between conquest and raid becomes blurred, we know Sargon and his men made it as far as Elam and Susa in present-day Iran, and Mari in Syria. In a poem titled Sargon, King of Battle, we see him exhorting his men on the eve of battle after crossing over the Aminus Mountains into Anatolia. Quote, Tomorrow, Akkad will go to battle. The celebration of the Manly will be held. The writhing ranks will writhe back and forth, two women in labor, bathed in their own blood. Where are true comrades who just look on at the celebration? Only the coward will stand aside. So there, any king who would rival me, let him go where I have gone." End quote. In other such poems, the words that are put in the mouth of Sargon are those of destruction, of storm strongholds and cities reduced to ruins, of populations uprooted, exiled, with only their bones remaining, burnt or left to the rats. What do we make of this? It is an abject portrayal of empire, utterly devoid of clemency, benevolence, or any pretense of moral rectitude. The picture we get of this Bronze Age empire is that might makes right. However, one cannot help but feel that there is something almost refreshing about this unabashed honesty and the lack of pretended moral superiority which later empire builders would cloak themselves in. On the other hand, the grandiosity on display is a historical constant, but so too, it seems, is satire. Within only a few centuries of his death, a text known as Sargon, Lord of the Lies, poked fun at the excess of Sargonic propaganda through the use of clever wordplay, conflating the Akkadian word for lies with the similar-sounding Sumerian word for writing. This made it clear that the people of Mesopotamia knew well how to take an imperial hegemon's claims with just a grain of salt. But in addition to giving us destruction, grandiosity, and satire, we see the first empire in history also contributing to some measure of material progress. Even if Sargon was the prototypical warrior king who spent almost the entirety of his reign on campaign, it was not all raising cities and burning farmsteads. There were also widespread road and canal building projects and the establishment of trade routes and a postal system. With the Persian Gulf safely in Akkadian control, its harbors became frequented by ships coming from the cities of Magan and Dilmun in the eastern Arabian Peninsula, and from the faraway city of Meluha near the Indus River. Even though it would fall on his successors to solidify control over many of the territorial gains and resources that he had secured, by the end of Sargon's reign, the foundations for an empire had been set in stone. And it was this, in addition to the sheer scope and scale of his conquests, that distinguished Sargon from the would-be emperors like Ionadam of Lagash, Enchakushana of Uruk, and of course, Lugal Zagazi of Uma. Sargon was the culmination of the proto-imperial process that had begun in Sumer decades and centuries ago. He was the outsider capable of transcending the ancient vendettas of squabbling city-states, 
the Philip of Macedon arriving after the conclusion of the Peloponnesian Wars. But at this point you may be asking, what foundations for empire did Sargon set exactly? What did he do after his conquests to ensure that his empire would outlast him? The first thing to understand is that although he was not known for his clemency, Sargon was a pragmatic ruler, leaving in charge many of the same city governors or enses. He also allowed these cities to enjoy a level of autonomy, namely the freedom to use the Sumerian language and worship the same gods, with this crucial difference. The Ensi was no longer a divinely ordained shepherd of the people, answerable only to his patron deity. Now he had to answer to Sargon and his successors, and also to send tribute and taxes. It would fall on Sargon of Akkad's greatest successor to standardize weights and measures for the purpose of improving imperial tax collection. But already, scribes were expected to adopt Akkadian when engaged in accounting, record keeping, or the production of royal inscriptions. Furthermore, unlike with the Enses, Sargon was not above confiscating the estates of smaller landlords, entrusting their property to Akkadians instead. Here's where it gets interesting. Under Sargon and his successors, one was considered Akkadian not simply on the basis of birth, but also merit and loyalty. That meant you did not have to be born in Akkad to be Akkadian and to rise through the ranks, hold office, and earn imperial favor. You simply had to be capable and trusted by Sargon and his family. Thus, this meritocratic system of patronage gave rise to an inchoate Akkadian identity, formed on the basis of a common language and pantheon of gods. But this pantheon of gods was not yet entirely welded together. It would take a marriage alliance to accomplish that. For you see, lacking any equals, Sargon gave his daughter's hand not to a man, but to a god. That is, he named her a high priestess devoted to the cult of the Sumerian moon god Nana, also known as Sin in Akkadian. We know of this because of an alabaster disc found in Ur, the city her temple was located in. This disc refers to the wife of Nana and daughter of Sargon of Akkad, bearing the illustrious name of Enheduanna, meaning ornament of heaven. The transliteration of the name Enheduanna suggests that it may have begun as a title, as indeed may have been the case with the name Sargon itself, which transliterated an Akkadian to something like the legitimate ruler. The temple that Enheduanna oversaw in Ur, the birthplace of Abraham, was rivaled in importance only by the city's palace. In fact, it was probably the most important temple in the Sumerian world, which in a holdover from the days of so-called temple rule, still afforded great veneration to these sprawling complexes encompassing not just sites of worship, but also residences, barns, storage houses, and gardens. As high priestess, Enheduanna commanded a staff of hundreds or maybe even thousands of attendants, running the gamut from her estate manager Ada, to her hairdresser Elum Palilis, to the destitute and downtrodden, to the nameless laborers and gardeners and herdsmen and healers and weavers. Add to this army of attendants the fact that she was the daughter of the most powerful man in the known world, and one can begin to fathom the power Enheduanna wielded, which she would use to spearhead the greatest project of religious syncretism Mesopotamia had yet seen, presiding over a cross-dressing, androgynous clergy dedicated to Nana and his daughter Inanna, who had the power to turn a man into a woman and a woman into a man, we are told. Enheduanna composed over 40 poems with themes ranging from spirituality to war. In Enheduanna's Lament on War, her tone belongs to that of a different era, so different from the sargonic inscriptions that one reads in such great numbers. It reads, quote, You hack down everything you see, war god. Rising on fearsome wings, you rush to destroy our land. Raging like thunderstorms, howling like hurricanes, screaming like tempests, thundering, raging, ranting, drumming, whiplashing whirlwinds. Men falter at your approaching footsteps. <laughs> tortured dirges scream on your lyre of despair." End quote. Yet this Enheduanna, who has been hailed as the first author that we know by name in history, is best known for her three hymns dedicated to Inanna. Inanna was none other than Ishtar to the Akkadians, the same goddess who had showered Sargon with such good fortune, and who in essence the Hittites, Greeks, and Phoenicians alike worshipped under different names. In the hymn Inin Segura, Enheduanna pioneers the ecstatic literary style that later religious texts would employ. It reads, quote, 
You are magnificent, Inanna. Your name is praised. You alone are magnificent. My lady, I am yours. This will always be so. May your heart be soothed towards me. Your divinity is resplendent in the land. My body has experienced your great punishment. Lament, bitterness, sleeplessness, distress, separation, mercy, compassion, care. Lenience and homage are yours, and to cause flooding, to open hard ground, and to turn darkness into light." End quote. By comparison, the Psalms of the Bible tended to lack Enheduanit's sensuality, with only few exceptions like the Song of Songs. Ultimately, Enheduanna succeeded in fusing Akkadian and Sumerian deities into something resembling the Greco-Roman pantheon of gods, which it seems to have directly inspired. She transformed Nana from an inscrutable god to a more compassionate one, and Inanna from a local fertility deity into the queen of heaven. She was her father's daughter, competent and capable, but in a different sense, she could not be more different. Her grave would be honored long after she was gone with offerings that revealed to us that even during such an unforgiving and violent epoch, there was some room for mercy. But it would not be mercy. It would be force that kept Sargon's empire together. Even at the end of his reign, Sargon was preoccupied with crushing one rebellion after another. He faced resistance at various times from the Sumerian Enses in the very center of his empire that he had thought to spare, as well as the hardy frontier peoples like the Elamites in the east and the Suberians in the north, and it would be much the same with his successors. And yet despite this unending onslaught, one imagines that Sargon died knowing all too well that he would be remembered long after he was gone. What Alexander the Great was to the Mediterranean, Sargon the Great would be to Mesopotamia. Many other conquerors would come after him, but at least as far as we know, he will always be the first to have carved out an empire, establishing a dynasty that would follow in his footsteps. Much like the city builders of Uruk, the empire builders of Akkad were building something that was meant to last, and they were far from finished. your father, the great hero. I fight for more than vengeance now, Sargon. I fight for what my father once believed in. And I fight for what you've corrupted. Mark that down, scribe. Sounds like a good epitaph. That's right, you fool. I planned every detail of your little heroic journey into the underworld. This sword makes my power supreme. You can never trust a Greek, eh? 